Okay. So thank you again uh, for giving us this opportunity. Um, so today uh, I will uh, go on with the axiom. So maybe I will come back to the univalence axiom and directed univalence, maybe introduce a couple of other axioms uh, and then maybe discuss uh, a couple of consequences of the axioms um, uh, in terms of uh, existence of co-limits, can extensions. Uh, I will be quick, but uh, I think it would be worth mentioning that. Um, and uh, yeah, then uh, depending on the, the time that remains, so I could give examples of a nice theorem we can have, we can try to prove. And uh, and eventually also, if we have time, uh, we could, uh, I would like to discuss uh, uh, syntax a little bit. And, uh, but it doesn't matter if I don't do everything I just said. I mean, you can so interrupt me uh, at any time and I prefer to, to spend some time on some particular case that everyone understands that trying the, rather than explaining everything I planned and then no one listen. So, okay. Uh, so I'd like to come back on the director of univalence. Uh, so I will state it in a way which introduces slightly less axioms, which is, uh, 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 so I mean, uh, you can prove you can go from back and forth on the two formulations. So remember that to, to formulate the uh, director of univalence, so first we have to introduce um, uh, the, this uh, internal home here. Which is over A, so given the two uh, co cartesian vibrations over A, X and Y, uh, we want to introduce this internal home. And so the idea is that uh, if you have a map from A prime to A, uh, to promote it into a map to this internal home, uh, it consists to pull back these two vibrations uh, over A prime and then provide a comparison map. Uh, that is essentially the definition. And this can be constructed using uh, appropriate uh, dependent products, which exist uh, as part of uh, axioms for co Cartesian vibrations. So this makes sense, uh, as Tashi explained to us last, last time already. And then we introduce a new uh, subobject. So for this, we I did, we didn't do that properly, but uh, there is a way to, to introduce a, a subtype uh, out of uh, a collection of edges. And here the edges would be the, 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 the maps which correspond to uh, co Cartesian functors uh, between the co Cartesian vibrations here. And this defines uh, a subobject. Uh, and once we introduce this gadget, so now we would like to say that if ever we have uh, a given co Cartesian vibration P, then we can pull it back uh, over A times A. Uh, we get two new uh, co Cartesian vibrations, x times a and a times x. Uh, and what we want is to introduce, to produce a canonical map. Canonical, it would be canonical up to equivalence, up to homotopy, if you want, uh, associated to this uh, vibration p. So I will explain how we can do that. Okay. Um, so the, the idea is that uh, from uh, our uh, vibration P, we have the evaluation map from delta one times uh, the cut of arrows of A to A, which is here. And therefore we can pull it back and get a new vibration pi. And then this new vibration pi, I can pull back further, taking the two endpoint of our interval and get uh, W zero and W one. And then you can observe that uh, this new uh, vibration can be obtained by direct pullback. Uh, so W0 is obtained by uh, this pullback and W1 uh, from this pullback. Okay. Um, and so now once we have this thing, so to, to produce a map we wanted, we want to produce a map from W0 to W1 which preserve co Cartesian edges. And this uh, is obtained as follows. So first we produce this commutative square uh, and observe that it is just given by the data we started from. So basically W0 is embedded in W by construction because it's a fiber of the map pi. 
And then uh, uh, it is embedded in delta one time uh, W0. So this notation is made to say that we use the endpoint zero in delta one to define this map. Yeah. Um, and then we get uh, uh, a commutative square. And a commutative square, it is in fact an element that is an object in this uh, relative slice pi over C. And then because uh, the evolution at zero um, uh, is a, has a, a right adjoint, because pi is a co-cartesian vibration, it's part of the definition, we have this uh, uh, dotted uh, blue arrow, which is uh, the right adjoint. And so if we apply this dotted arrow to the element given by the square, it gives us an element in here, and this element in this is this uh, feeling that we get. And then what you have to check is that because we did uh, pro provide this element using an adjoint, and therefore with a suitable universal property, uh, the map that we get will be in fact a map um, uh, uh, whenever, so the idea is that we have this map then we put it back to, uh, to over one. So the, the, the new, um, so this object pull back over one would give back W0, and this object pull back over one would give us W1, and therefore this dotted map would give us the comparison map here. And then the fact that it is obtained by this universal property will ensure that the map we produce from W0 to W1 preserve co Cartesian edges. And, uh, and therefore, and maybe you should think of it as uh, it really leaves. With that, and it preserves the Cartesian edges, and therefore defines what we wanted, which was um, a map like this. Yeah. And uh, so now that uh, we are there, so we uh, uh, we uh, define uh, 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 Cartesian vibration uh, to be uh, directed univalent if the corresponding map that we have is an equivalence here. This is the definition. And uh, so our axiom is that we have a hierarchy of uh, universe, of uh, Cartesian universes like this. And in particular, uh, any Cartesian vibration uh, would be the pullback of a uh, univalent one. Th that's an axiom, right? Yeah, it's an axiom. That's why. Uh, <laughs> yes, that's, that's the. In a slightly different way, but. Okay. Yeah. So uh, that's a kind of categorical interpretations of Voivodsky univalence. Uh, am I right to say that? It is. Uh, maybe I could. Uh, maybe did I say that on the other slide? So what I mean is that. Uh, so you can think of it as a, what you can see in the formula highlighted here, and uh, in fact you could also look at the, the full set category on the left here. Uh, so. Uh, of this object here, uh, which consists of isomorphisms. And on the right, you could look at the subobject which consists of equivalences like that. Yeah. And the equivalence the, that we require uh, will induce an equivalence on this subobject. And the equivalence on this subobject is uh, classical univalence. Because you see, the point is that uh, um, the, the, the 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 subobject of uh, uh, so maybe we did find it this way I think which is full here uh, this is a, a a pass object of the universe cat yeah. and therefore an equivalence and uh, and so what we are saying in fact is that if we if we restrict to equivalences here yeah. And then do uh, here the, the same thing as what you get uh, here. Uh, you will have an induced equivalence, and this induced equivalence is literally uh, classical univalence. So it is an extension of univalence in the sense that we don't speak of invertible maps only, but of all maps. But this subsumes uh, uh, the, the classical thing uh, because we control equivalences of co Cartesian vibration. I mean, of, of course, we need some knowledge, but it, it was included in the formula axioms, in fact. 
So it is more general and to my knowledge, not implied directly from uh, classical univalence. Yeah, but, but I mean, um, if I may comment on this oh, is sure. that, yeah. uh, uh, well, um, classical univalence is somehow the groupoid case of that. Yes, exactly. Yes, but it was not completely obvious uh, at the beginning that uh, Wojewski univalence axiom was saying that a certain functor was fully faithful in some sense. Yeah. So that's uh, uh, you're contributing to um, enriching the understanding of uh, even classical uh, multiplicity theory. In some sense, yeah. It's, it's... I don't know if uh, Steve has comment on that. <laughs> I don't know either. <laughs> I'll wait until the end and see. Okay, sorry. Okay. No. So let's wait. Um, so we come back to univalence maybe later on. Uh, maybe just to uh, but, uh, 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 yeah, maybe just to, to comment. So first, uh, this equivalence that is uh, highlighted here, uh, we can exponentiate it and therefore obtain for any type A um, uh, such uh, an equivalence, uh, which is here. And because this equivalence lives uh, over this product, we can take it fiber-wise. And fiber-wise, that means that we take a pair of objects uh, that is a, 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 an element of the, the bottom here. So a pair is a F1, F2 here, and they correspond to a, a pair of vibrations. And uh, in fact, fiber-wise, this equivalence that we have here will give us the highlighted equivalence in pink here. And so that really says that the mapping space of maps between F1 and F2 as functors is the same as the mapping space of the corresponding vibrations. So you see the, the right hand side here is really uh, in the syntactic category. So it is in the strict world, whereas the left hand side is purely in the universe. And so this is what univalence is about. So it really says that we can go back and forth between vibrations in the external sense, in the syntactic sense, and functors that are maps into the universe. Um, Uh, and maybe uh, I could add uh, maybe uh, quickly that, uh, so you could look at uh, uh, look at uh, vibrations over A, which you could define as a full subcategory, a uh, non-full I mean, non subcategory of the slice, whose objects are uh, co-cartesian vibrations over A and maps are full torso to reserve co-cartesian edges. And then um, you can look at the uh, maps into the universe. And of course, there is a size issue. So you could restrict to those vibrations which are full backed of the universal population vibration, but uh, up to size problem. The idea is that for any uh, uh, type, we can define a one category. And uh, this, uh, and then what we say is that this is a localization. In the, class, in the sense of classical one category theory as a consequence. So that's really a way to relate the motu P theory of Cartesian vibrations in, in our syntactic category and the category of types. And it is functorially in A. Denishal, can you move up uh, your page a little bit? I will try that, but I'm afraid it will be difficult, but uh, I can try something like this, for instance. Put it here and then try. Is it better? Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Sorry, could you, uh, I'm, look, I'm confused about the highlighted thing in pink. Um, okay. So, yeah. uh, so by f the right hand side in particular, you're not you're no longer mm -hmm. talking about co-Cartesian functors. Uh, yes, and this is what I mean. Uh, so I, I am. So it's not obvious in the notation, but let's say explicitly we are. 
Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> yes. So right. I should put a declaration saying that it is about co-cartesian photons. You are right. Thank you. Uh, okay. And sorry, what is the relationship between F and X in? Uh, it is given by this uh, th this community. So F is given. Yep. And there and I have a universal ah. formation, so I pull back. Yeah. 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 Okay. This is the relation between the two. But so XI is supposed to be the pullback of FI. Stent of F or something. Okay. Yep. Okay. Good. Uh, so as I said, so it's really uh, about uh, the re relation, the correspondence between co-cartesian vibrations and photons. Uh, and uh, just as a remark also is that uh, you see that uh, in some sense, the type dependency in, in our directed context is in A here, but uh, the, the notation uh, I put here is actually not very good because it's not a slice, yeah? It's really just a non full subcategory of the slice category, but it's still dependent on A in the sense that it is contravalently functorial with respect to, to pullbacks. And the, and the, the right-hand side as well. Uh, and what I mean is that uh, the type dependency, so it's not uh, about uh, slicing exactly, but uh, if you restrict to groupoids, um, then any isofibration of A is co-cartesian. And in fact, you have this kind of equivalence that is of a groupoid slicing or, or looking at uh, functors index by groupoid is really the same thing, which is why uh, if you restrict to groupoids, the type dependency will really look like the classical one. Yeah? And I think in terms of uh, syntax and manipulation of formulas, this has an effect and this explains why our elements are indexed by groupoids and everything works out well because for groupoids, everything is fine. And uh, the univalence uh, is quite uh, transparent and, uh, and well behaved. But for non groupoid uh, objects, uh, it's slightly more complicated. Also, as a last remark to relate with classical univalence, um, then you can look at the you have the, 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 the universe and the objects of the universe are literally types up to size problems in some sense. They are small, the small ones, if you want. And then you can take the full subtype of groupoids and, uh, and then pull back uh, and obtain a new uh, co cartesian vibrations. And this will be in fact a left vibration and that will be the universal left vibration. And because it is fully faithful here, again, directed univalence would be true for this one. And then because uh, left vibrations are conservative, that we mean literally that this square is an homotopy pullback uh, when you go to the maximum group of it here. And so the, the left-hand side finally will be in fact uh, just another vibration between the group of it. And that will be just, in, it will be direct, univalent in the directed sense we just said, but it will be univalent in the classical sense uh, a la Voigt, a la Voigtsky. And in fact, because uh, uh, groupoids from a, a semantic interpretation of uh, classical hot, uh, this will be the univalent universe that we get. So in, in this sense, that also explains how directed univalence uh, contains uh, classical univalence uh, if we restrict to groupoids. And it is uh, 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 made, uh, explained by this uh, homotopy pullback squares uh, here. Okay, then uh, I go on with another axiom. So the axioms are highlighted in blue. And so we will ask that there is a natural number object. And here I really mean these axioms in the setting of ordinary uh, uh, dependent type theory. So it is really within uh, groupoids. Uh, so, uh, so I just say that uh, with the universal property, we're saying that we can do piano arithmetics or something like that. Now, a consequence uh, of this axiom is that uh, because we can join uh, with, a, with, a, with a point on the left, say, uh, this formula, which is give you an iterative way to produce types, uh, then if we interpret this simplex as an object of the universe, uh, then uh, it means that we produce an act actually a map by definition of a natural number object, because we, we did it by induction process, 
we give we obtain a map to the universe and actually to the, the maximum groupoid of the universe, right. just a family of objects. And then we can check that uh, uh, all our axioms saying that uh, the, the simplex was zero truncated and so forth and so forth, say that this functor is actually fully spaceful and therefore we can apply a full type former. And therefore we can take the full subcategory of the universe whose objects are the simplices. And this defines the simplex category as an internal object. It is completely internal. You have to realize that you could also do, I don't know, category theory in a elementary infinity purpose in some, in some sense, like uh, as did uh, Nimarasek or something like that. And therefore you could have uh, delta n with n uh, non-standard uh, integer or whatever. Yeah, it's not the usual delta, but who cares? So internally it is there. Um, um, and therefore we can now start to, to play with uh, simplicial methods. Yeah, I, I have a question. Just want to make sure I understand. Okay. Um, in order to take the full subcategory of cat, uh, you um, uh, that that's something. That's an operation which is uh, uh, like factoring a functor has um, has. Um, Bijective on objects and so-called, yeah, bijective on object and fully faithful uh, functor. Am I right? Yes, yes, something like that. But uh, okay. he, here we don't need to use this factorization right away because, as I, I mean, we could do that, but uh, the axioms imply that the map we produce, this one, is already fully faithful as a map of groupoids. That there are no right. automorphisms of the simplicity. Uh, right. I mean, I, I, you have to believe me. I just say that I claim that the axiom implies that there are no non trivial automorphisms of simplices. Okay. And, and therefore, and as I said, we, we did introduce in our axioms that whenever we have um, a full embedding of groupoids in the maximal groupoid of a type, then we can take the full subcategory. Okay. I see. That's where you're using this axiom. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, so we apply this full type formula. But yes. if, we, if, we, if it was not known that, uh, if, we, if we didn't know that this is fully faithful, then we would have to use uh, this factorization system you, you just said. Yes. Which maybe I see. But here Which you don't, be because it's. A... The consequence of the axiom, but uh, as I said, we don't have to implement this kind of proofs right away. We can just say this is existing now. Okay. Okay. I see. So delta is defined as a full subcategory of cat, which I like too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the delta. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now another axiom, which is a fat join axiom. So remember, we did introduce a join uh, with a universal property as a dependent product. And now what I say is that we can produce a commutative square canonically for any type uh, A and B. So you have to say what, what are the, the maps. Of course, the, the map here is easy. It's a, it's a canonical inclusion. And so using the universal property of the join, uh, all these maps are in fact produced by the, the diagram that is here. Uh, so first you have to see a times delta one times delta b over delta one, but that is easy. It is through the obvious projection to delta one. Then uh, you can take a times the boundary of delta one times b, which is in fact in this guy is just two copies of a times b. And then the first copy you send to a by the first projection, and the second copy you send to b by the second projection. And this gives you a diagram of a delta one. And now if you contemplate at home, or if you're already at home or whenever you have time, the universal property of the join, we'll see that this diagram defines a unique uh, map here, uh, which makes uh, this square commute. And uh, so this is just uh, given by the universal property of the join. And the axiom, so it is an axiom here, uh, claim that this, uh, canonical square is an homotopy pushout. And so we just recall what it means that a square uh, like this uh, is an homotopy pushout. 
simply means that whenever you, you exponentiate it uh, with, in, with value in any type E, uh, you get an homotopy pullback here. Yeah. So you, you're not uh, supposing the existence of homotopy push out in your trial. No. You're just saying that this, <laughs> yes. Yes. this uh, specific square turns out to be an homotopy yeah. push out. Uh, as we see, the axons would imply that from an internal point of view, it would be very co-complete, but, uh, but uh, not co-complete in the strict sense, but it would be homotopy co-complete, that's for sure. So in some sense, homotopy push out will exist anyway, but uh, okay. we, don't, we don't say that yet. And we don't need it because you see we already have the object so we just claim that the, the guy we already have has this universal property because we don't really care that the homotopy push out has an explicit model is what i mean uh okay and so a consequence of uh yeah sorry to change the slides almost done so the consequence of this uh, fat join axiom is uh, the highlighted equivalences that we have so basically Using uh, the minimum and uh, the maximum uh, map, which are the two, uh, uh, which are the way to say that delta one uh, has an initial object and a terminal object. Yeah, remember. Uh, then, uh, and the universal property of the join, you can produce a canonical comparison maps where, so the, the corner here, so the square is defined as a product of two intervals, and the, the, up, the upper left corner. Is a full type with object uh, with pairs 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. And you have a dual version for the lower corner. And then you can just check that you have canonical maps. And using this fat join axiom and the other axioms as well, because you, you need to, to, to uh, also the fact that if you have a, a functor between co Cartesian vibrations, which preserve co Cartesian edges, then being an equivalence uh, can be detected fiber wise and these kind of things. You can deduce uh, this uh, uh, equivalences, uh, which express the fact that uh, to, 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 to go from, an, uh, to, to, from a corner, so from an upper left corner to a full square, just add formally a terminal object, that is to join the terminal object. And uh, vice versa, uh, the dual version, I mean, for the initial object in the lower right corner. And another consequence of this computation is that uh, you can express uh, the commutative square, that is uh, the product of two intervals, as an homotopy push out, uh, saying that it, can, it is obtained by gluing two simplices of dimension two. And that means that for, to produce a commutative square in a type A consists to, in producing a triangle like that, and then a second triangle like that, which is also exactly what we think. At least in the examples, like uh, we, we, we can cut uh, commutative squares into a bunch of triangles. And, uh, and all these little computations, they, they look uh, very uh, tiny, but uh, they are actually extremely important because uh, they are exactly what you need uh, when you think about pullback squares. Because pullback squares, uh, you think of them uh, in several ways. First, there is a universal property of a pullback square, which would say that. The pullback square it fits in a commutative square, and if ever you 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 give yourself another a bigger commutative square with s x y t, you have a unique map like this making the diagram commute. That would be one universal property. Another universal property is that you want to think of the pullback square as the limit of this thing seen as a diagram index by this type. And finally, there is a third way to think of pullbacks, which is that. Uh, using the map from T to Y, if ever you have something uh, over T, you can compose and then uh, or take the dependent sum, I would say, and then get something over Y. And this operator has a right adjoint, which consists to pull back. And this, and this, and this provides a third notion uh, of pullback, which is highlighted here. And in fact, when you manipulate pullbacks, you go from each of these three points of view all the time, and usually without noticing. And so all these axioms about fat joints, they are just there to allow you to do exactly that. And therefore that means that all, everything you know about pullbacks, it will just hold on the nose literally. And so you can reason with pullbacks um, as usual. This is what these axioms mean. Uh, Denis Charles, what, what category level are we at right now? Are we, are, 
X, Y, Z, T, are these types or are these elements inside some ambient type? All of the above. All of the above. And and the... <laughs> but I really mean, I, I, what, what I want to do, like the aim of this remark is that I want them to be uh, elements in a type. I really want to say that if I want to understand what it means to have a pullback square in a type, yeah. is then I can do it. This is what these epsilon are supposed to mean. But uh, yeah, and that's uh, it. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I'm a bit confused. Uh, of course, we, we know what is uh, a multiple pullback uh, in a tribe. So. Um, no, it's not in the tribe. So that was a question of Emily. So I mean that here, uh, the X and Y could be object in a type, an object of your tribe. Okay. You see, so these are objects in the in the in the. Yeah. Yeah. Elements. Objects, are elements. Is the X and Y are elements of an object. Yeah. The tribe. Ter term terms of a type. Yeah. So we are really internal now, quite internal. Okay. So you you're explaining what what, what it is to have a pullback square. Uh, internally, yeah, but be because of univalence, it's also saying something about the external thing. Okay, so thank you. So at the end, this is why I answered to Emily all of the above because it's really governed everything. But the but the, the, the goal is really to work internally in the in type in the in the types. Yeah, the types are some kind of categories and you want to work in them and therefore provide the limits, co-limits and so forth. So now our axioms are called optional in the sense that uh, I like them and I would like to have them, but uh, in some sense, they can be deduced from the others, except that if you deduce, if you try to deduce them, they will be, they will be uh, only true up to equivalence and not very strict. And uh, I'm not yet convinced we have to to, to, to cope with the extra difficulty of not having them. But if you are a purist, you could also avoid them and try to have them as a consequence of everything else. So uh, the axiom would be to introduce an opposite operator. So just an involution uh, saying that uh, you could it up. And you ask that uh, if you do it twice, you get the identity. Of course, it should be functorially. Yeah? And here we are at the level of the tribe. Yeah? And, uh, and the condition is that uh, uh, there should be an isomorphism between the op of the interval and the interval itself. And this should exchange the initial object and the terminal object. And the point is that once you have this isomorphism, you can extend it using the universal property of the join. It extends uniquely into an equivalence like that functorially in X and Y. And it's also not very difficult to have this kind of formula. And uh, finally, so we could ask that there is a unit on bidding. That is, you ask that uh, there is a right vibration. So usually I work with left vibrations, but uh, and I think that this notation, at least in Kerodon uh, or Lurie, really is for the right vibration. So I introduce it this way. Uh, so you ask that functorially in A, we can produce a right vibration like this, such that whenever you project using the obvious projections, uh, all the fibers have initial objects. And uh, that is a way to, uh, and so of course, because it's a right vibration, so it is classified by, uh, it is a, uh, by a functor with value in groupoids, and this you call the home. Yeah, it's, a, it's a way to to speak of maps, and you see that uh, if you uh, if you look at uh, what we get uh, with objects, so whenever you have two objects, we did define this as a as a fiber, and then it is a type. But uh, uh, so maybe you could write it this way if you want. Yeah, but then it's not obviously functorial because uh, it, it doesn't even make sense. Whereas this purely internal point of view is really to make the home uh, a functor, an actual functor. This is what uh, this, uh, this map here means. In particular, it, it is completely compatible with composition law and so forth on the nodes. 
And then by transposition, uh, this defines uh, what we should call the unit on billing. And uh, here, so here is that, uh, the, uh, a comment about how we could try to to, to prove uh, to, to to deduce yeah, these axioms from uh, the, the former constructions. Um, so whenever we we get a, a functor with value in groupoids, uh, we can take the fiber and that is called its category of elements. I mean, at least uh, the, the domain of the fiber. And we could look at all this functor f so that uh, the co corresponding category of elements has an initial object. And then uh, you can uh, produce the full uh, subcategory of the category of covariant functors, which consists of such functors. And this you could define to be a op. And then by definition, you get the construction of this form that you can pull back. And then you could define this as op of that. And remember that we did define op at the same time. We did define op and home all together. But if you do that, you have a, um, uh, you, you will have to, to check that uh, this Twitter Darrow category is small whenever A is small, and you will introduce an op operator, which will be uh, an involution, but only up to equivalence and so forth. So it's really well, really well defined at the level of universe, but at the level of types, uh, it would be something else. So that would be a, an option. But just to say that in principle, the, 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 the homotopical information was already there. There is no need to add it. I say this because I really like to think of all this as something which only depends on the datum of an interval and everything else follows. That is the old, everything else we say are supposed to be properties somehow. And that's why, although I, I like to have a strict op and so forth, uh, the idea that we can deduce everything from the interval only, uh, I also like very much. Uh, okay, so maybe I can skip that because uh, I'm flies. Um, so here I'm just recording a, a notation. So now I, I think I finished uh, the list of axioms. Uh, and I will try to, to discuss some consequences and to, to explain how we can use them to organize further the, the theory. If you have still questions on the axiom, it would be a good moment. Otherwise, of course, we can wait for the end. Okay. Uh, so otherwise, so given a two uh, isofibrations P and Q, I mean, I just need Q to be an isofibration to strictly speaking. So remember we can form the, so here there is no decoration. So we really look at all maps from X to Y of a C, and you want to have a type of such maps. And this is exactly uh, what this object is, and it is obtained by the, this pullback. And uh, so remember that so we did introduce uh, pi infinity, that is a universal way to invert all maps in a type, or also equivalently, that's part of the axioms, it is a universal way to obtain a groupoid out of a type. And uh, so we could define uh, weak equivalences as those maps which induce an equivalence of groupoids when we invert all maps. And therefore, we have a notion of a weakly contractible uh, type. It is a type so that the map to the point is a weak equivalent. So for instance, uh, if you have an initial object or a terminal object, you are weakly contractible. That is an easy exercise. But of course, you might have more complicated examples. And so here is a theorem that I won't prove, but I think it is an important one because when you manipulate, uh, and when you do category theory, so you want to do uh, to have limits and co-limits, uh, or more generally, you can extensions, and you want that exist, and also you want to compute them. And the main tool to compute them is through uh, cofinality. So it is important to identify uh, cofinal maps, and you want them in a in a way which makes that. Uh, it is obvious that uh, they, they will be useful for computations of co-limits, and also in a way which should, should be make that it is not too difficult to check whether or not a map has some cofinality property or not. And so this theorem is about exactly that. So we could ask that uh, whenever you take uh, an object of the, the domain, so we take a map from U from A to B, 
And you could add that whenever you take uh, an object or an element uh, in, in the codomain, then the slice, which uh, remember is obtained by this kind of pullback, uh, is weakly contractible. Uh, and another uh, characterization is that um, this kind of functors, uh, whenever, uh, so we have functor from A to B, and whenever you want to see it over anything, that is, you choose an arbitrary map to uh, an arbitrary type C, and you take any left fabrication to C, then the left fabrication won't see the difference between A and B, and therefore it will the, the map U will induce an equivalence between these mapping spaces. And, uh, and then uh, the third one is a way to say, how can you construct such things? And you could look at guys which are retracts of composition of a map, which is a fully faceful right adjoint, followed by a map, which is a localization that is obtained by inverting a bunch of edges. So the third one is, is nice because it tells you how to construct them. And essentially, it says that this uh, process constructs all examples you could dream of. And uh, to, to, to fit with the terminology we have for quasi-categories, we could say these things are left anodized or limit cofinal or initial, depending on your taste, background, or what you want to do. Uh, and now I would like to uh, observe that uh, the fact you have an inclusion of all groupoids into uh, all types, but now you see it is as a map of universe, which is really a map of types. And this also will have left adjoints. This you did use from the, the way we did introduce by infinity, which was really at the, level, at the level of syntactic category, but now you can use directed univalence and also the fact that uh, to construct an adjoint, it just have to check uh, very minimal properties. Uh, so the consequence of the axiom is that you will have an actual adjoint uh, uh, which will encode uh, the formation of pi infinity, but at the level of the universe. And uh, now having adjoint uh, is it, it, comp compatible with exponentiation, and therefore for any a, the inclusion of functors from a to s into functors from A to, to, to universe of categories or of all types, we have a left adjoint that I will call like this right, to insist that it depends on A. And, uh, and therefore, that means that uh, if you have, I think what I wrote is not good at all. Sorry. So if you have a concatenation vibration A, that you could think of as a, an element uh, uh, on the left-hand side, like, because it will be classified by a map from A to the, uh, the uh, sorry, an element of the right-hand side here. So it will be classified by a map from A to cat. Then you can apply to this element, this left adjoint, and therefore get something on the left-hand side that will be exactly this guy, yeah? And the fact that you have an adjunction will mean that also the map is not invertible, but the directed univalence will also provide the comparison map, which is somehow the unit uh, of this adjunction. And that means that what we are doing is that we are in this uh, concatenation vibrations, we are uh, inverting edges, but fiber wise. This is, this is what this thing is doing. Because we, what we did in the absolute case, we did, we do now in the category of functors. And now something you have to prove, which I won't do it because it's, you need a little bit of preparation, is that uh, this fiberwise localization is globally uh, localization. That is, you can really identify uh, this uh, relative uh, thing as the localization of uh, X by those edges which are sent to identities in A. Or it, it, it amounts to the same thing, which are sent to uh, isomorphisms in A. Somehow what I'm saying is that you force the functor from X to A to become conservative. That's what it means. That gives you this map from pi infinity X over A to A. 
and uh, uh, that's what you get. And in particular, you see what we get is that we can factorize any concatenation vibration into a localization and a left vibration. Okay, and at the end of the day, uh, you get something which I think can be highlighted here. So what are we saying is that uh, if we start from after a map, completely arbitrary, because you have identity type, we can factorize it into an equivalence and then an iso vibration. Then this you can factorize into a fully faceful left eye joint and a co Cartesian vibration using the internal ohm and the interval object and so forth. And then using the device, uh, the localization we just discussed, this co Cartesian vibration, you can localize further and get a left vibration. And then you see that what you get is that you get a map from x to, uh, to pi infinity of y a, which is left anodyne, and then a left vibration. So we are providing the factorization system left anodyne maps and left vibrations as consequence of the axioms. And this uh, is an important uh, 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 step, say, to, to develop the theory further. Uh, and in some sense, if you think uh, of what we are doing, uh, we are saying that uh, you can look at all, um, all functors from A to S, which by directed univalence correspond to the full subcategory of the slice whose objects are left vibrations. And he says that this inclusion has a left adjoint. And from the external point of view, it corresponds exactly to what we did. You start from a, uh, something in the, in the slice, and then you associate to it this new guy on the on the right. And the horizontal maps give you the unit of the adjunction. And then you have to play with univalence and stuff like that. Or as I said, uh, it is a factorization system. And using this, uh, you can prove the following theorem, which is that both these categories are uh, so the, the universe uh, of group reads or universe of categories are uh, complete and co-complete. Uh, so maybe I could um, uh, spend uh, more time on that if you want. So remember that uh, um, uh, if you want to understand functors with value in the universe, and then you have the one category associated to that. And this uh, is a localization. So it will be the homotopy category in the classical sense. Maybe I, I will do it maybe for S because that's easier and then I have less decorations to boot. Uh, then I can look at say left vibrations of A where left vibrations is really, the, the, here that's really full, that is why it's easier. Uh, Secretary of the, uh, the uh, of the slice of A whose objects are left vibrations, and then you invert fiber-wise equivalences, and directed univalence give you an equivalence like that, where this H row here is ordinary localization, but it is functorially in A. And now, of course, uh, you have some size issue to to do. I mean. Uh, from A to S, it corresponds to left vibrations, which are small in some sense. And of course, you should take the, the small ones uh, here as well. I propose to neglect that. Uh, just, uh, you just have to change universes and stuff like that. Um, and um, so, and so what, what you want to do is you want to understand how, so you, you have, a, whenever you have a map, you, you have a pullback from top. Should go the other way, I guess. Of which you want to produce a left adjoint, and the idea is that uh, you can start to be less uh, ambitious to begin with, and then you will be ambitious again later on. You take the one categories, so you try to really produce an adjoint in the very ordinary sense, yeah. And then you use this, the equivalence uh, that is uh, highlighted here. So that means that uh, you want to produce this U over shriek. So in fact, what you get is 
um, left vibration here. Then you compose with u. And this you factorize into uh, something which is left anodyne. And then something which is a left vibration using the factorization system I described earlier on. And now, uh, so we'll say this was P key and Q. And let's say that uh, P was classified by F like this, and then Q because it's a left vibration. So it would be classified by a functor say G. And then you define U level shriek of F uh, to be this G. And then you can check that uh, the, the theorem I, uh, I mentioned here, uh, especially the second property would be exactly what you need to check and also with directed univalence uh, would be what you need to check that uh, what you did construct is indeed an adjunction like that. And, uh, and then uh, you can do uh, the same thing of course, here, uh, to, to make sense of it, you need to know that uh, A and B were small enough in some sense, but then you can check playing with universes and go, go, going into a larger universe, possibly, that for any X, when X is any type of any size, uh, you will have an adjunction like that. So we have the pullback where you take identity times u pullback, and then you will have a left adjoint. And that will be functorially in X. This, of course, you have to check. There's a bunch of computation to do, but they are quite elementary. It's a bunch of black Chapelet properties to check and so forth. And you can formulate that in ordinary category theory if you want. If you want. Also, you. You could also try to, to look at where can localization instead and so forth. And, and, but uh, if you don't want to know that you know quasi categories or stuff like that to begin with, you can just work with categories and, uh, and reason with that. And this, I will say essentially is that uh, uh, this, so as a consequence, it says that this functor. Uh, has a left adjoint uh, as a map in the two categories, the ordinary two category of types. You see where, because types are two category because uh, you see, you, 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 you can take uh, the one category of maps between two types. So you have a, a genuine strict two category of types. And therefore you have an interesting, interesting notion of adjoint in there. And what we have been discussing very, very quickly is the fact that we have such, such an adjunction and then you can check that it could be, it's quite formal, but it is equivalent to have an adjunction in whatever sense, maybe using univalence or directed univalence and so forth. That would be a way to prove you have uh, um, uh, such adjoints and maybe also just to say why you have limits. Um, just observe that uh, this is a left vibration and therefore for any type which is small I mean for any type sorry it's not this is a left vibration so put it pi and maybe that's pi over star if you want or something like that and now if a is small enough like uh, that is a uh, this is full of cat and a small means that uh, it is obtained by pullback like that. Then in fact you can check that this has small fibers and therefore it is classified by a map. And this you call limit a. Yeah. Of course, you have to check it has a suitable universal property, but I just say that uh, the, 
if all the ingredients you need to or limits to exist are provided up to tiny computations like this. Okay. Um, and, uh, and again, the fact that if A is small, uh, the fiber of pi level star are small, uh, can be deduced from directed univel because it's essentially said that uh, this category of uh, functors from A to S has small mapping spaces. And this you can check using directed univalence because you can, you can control that very much. Uh, okay. Oh yeah, and then I should come back to a former slice I think, because I went, wanted to explain the. Uh, so as I said, you, you can do a similar version uh, for the, the universe of categories to have, say that it's complete and co-complete. And the consequence uh, is that then you can define a nerve functor that is associated to each type uh, this home. It really is a set of simplices uh, of A Functorially, with respect to simplicial operators, it is literally what the nerve is. And then, uh, because once you have limits and co-limits and so forth, you can develop this. I won't do now, but all the theory of pointwise can extensions and distributors and whatnot. In particular, you can do uh, what can extensions were made for when they were introduced uh, by CAN uh, in the 50s. It was to produce a left adjoint to nerve-like functors, and you would be able to do that. And, uh, and that means that now from the internal point of view, you can really compare the universe of categories and the universe of simplicial objects with value in the universe of group points. And you have an adjunction between them. And so what I wanted to say as a theorem is that this adjunction uh, uh, is nice in the sense that the nerve functor is fully faithful. And the essential image is, consists exactly of complete Segal objects. So the fact that uh, uh, you can describe uh, the theory of categories of infinity one categories, if you want, using complete Segal spaces would be true internally. Uh, also something we can uh, highlight is that uh, now uh, this category of simple objects, it behaves like ordinary type theory because you see it is internally like a topos. And also, uh, uh, you can do uh, the theory of Scaletta. That is, you, you can see that you can, uh, uh, so this I, I didn't make explicit because, uh, but you can do really, really like inductions to say what are functors from a type A to a type B. Because what you say is that you see them as a simple object here with value in group weights. And the idea is that uh, the theory of Scaletta is a way to say that uh, if you know, how to send a simplex of A to a simplex of B, the theory of Scaletta gives you conditions to uh, enhance this kind of knowledge to an actual functor um, or an actual map from A to B. That is, you can really reduce all the data to form maps uh, from uh, uh, what they do on simplices. And, uh, and so the, the remark that I make uh, here is that uh, we could also, uh, add this as an axiom to begin with, because that is a consequence of everything else. So it doesn't cost anything. And that would be a way to, to, to enforce that uh, we can construct uh, maps uh, through, them, through inductive processes just by knowing what they do on uh, simplices. That would be a way to, to form a syntactic category in some way. Also that's not the way we did think of it so far, but. Uh, that would be a possibility. Then uh, you can tell me if I'm too fast or whatever. Otherwise, I can go on with your name, Alema. Okay. So the unit Alema, so you will start with uh, uh, a type which is small. That means it is obtained from a pullback square of this form. And then uh, you can take the full circuit, so it means it belongs to a universe, cat, and then you can take the full universe of groupoids of the same size, and then you can define three sheaves on A 
to be contravariant functor that are functors from A up to S, that is the universe of gopoids of the same size as A. And then you have the unit on BD, which is essentially given by this vibration here. Yeah. On the other hand, you have also uh, the home of, uh, as I said, this category uh, of pre-shifts. Using univalence, you can check that uh, its mapping space has is small, and therefore you have a classifying functor like this for the, the mapping space. When here I say pullback, but it's not really pullback; it's more homotopy pullback, if you want. It's not strictly speaking this. Uh, uh, or it depends. I mean, I, I only care about this home up to equivalence, so I could define this home so that this is actual, actually the actual pullback. Yeah, because the point of univalence is that it can work up to equivalence anyway. So these are just details somehow. And then you can look at the map from A up times pre sheaves to pre sheaves up times pre sheaves given by unit embedding up times identity and give you this map and then produce a new vibration here by pulling back and then having this pullback. And then observe that uh, 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 you, you have a conductive diagram like that, that uh, the, the, the map from, um, uh, if you go all the way from A up times A to S, you get literally um, the, the uh, uh, I mean, you, you have to prove it, sorry, that, that you, 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 you will get the, the, the mapping space of A, and that would be about saying that uh, the unidal, the unidal bidding, so you have to prove it, but it's not that difficult, but I propose to admit it, is fully faithful. And that would mean that this is also an multiple pullback square because uh, the, 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 the full composite will be uh, uh, the multiple pullback square as well uh, because of this uh, fully faithfulness, because it really says that uh, the, the composite is up to equivalence, the mapping space. Okay. Then uh, slightly easier. So you have the evaluation map which is given here by definition of uh, this category of functors. And then you compose with, uh, again, uh, identity of A op times the unit on bidding. And then the composite is literally the, the home of A. And therefore, now if you form this pullback square, uh, you will get again, like literally, uh, the, 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 the twisted diagonal, which correspond to the mapping space of A. And uh, now you, you get two, uh, two maps, uh, this uh, small w, w and this small V. And, uh, and, and the theorem you can prove using uh, ingredients which were introduced before, it has these two maps, so the small V and the small, w, uh, sorry, nice W, I guess, somewhere. Are left anodyne. And uh, so if you look at the way we did introduce uh, left can extensions, which were this, uh, where was that? Uh, this thing, sorry, should come back or not? Yes. Uh, if you remember how we did produce. Uh, left can extensions, which are really literally uh, this construction. You see, you you start from an object, you factorize into left anodyne, and then vibration, and that defines this log of three. Yeah. So if you look at what I'm just what I'm saying now, which is sorry, uh, one slide. So I think maybe here. Yeah. What this says, and maybe going back to the previous slide. Saying that uh, it is so, they are left anodyne. So it means that, in fact, the, the this uh, this W here, it is in fact the left can extension of this uh, of this uh, vibration along this functor. And here we have the same functor and another guy, which is also the left can extension along the same functor. And so, in particular, they have to be isomorphic. So this thing is isomorphic to that, 
And because it is formulated in the language of vibrations, this is a really, really functorial in both variables, small a, small f. And also what you can check is that if you can extend along a fully faceful functor, I mean, uh, I mean, can extending along a fully faceful functor is a fully faceful procedure. And that means that this isomorphism you provide, it is completely characterized by the fact that uh, um, it induces an isomorphism when you restrict uh, to the indexing category. That is when you come back to uh, A ops than A. And that means that this isomorphism you provide is a unique one. So uh, that you provide is a unique one which extends the one you obtain by the knowledge of the fact that H is fully faithful. And therefore, you see that this, this map here is very well defined. It's just saying that H is a functor, so you have a map. That's just a property that it is an equivalence. And also what this theorem tells you is that once you have this map, there is a unique way to extend it to a full-fledged uh, equivalence like that in a functorial way. And once you have that, you can really go further in the theory of kind extensions and uh, and prove a bunch of formulas that I won't um, develop right away. Uh, so now there are just a bunch of comments. So I guess it's difficult to read, but I will just comment on that. I think the slides will be or maybe are already available or will be available eventually. So you don't have to read this. I think it's painful. I will just comment on it. Uh, what I mean is that we could try to develop category theory from there um, and go further and further. And that would be very nice and that would work out very well. Uh, but what I mean is that now that uh, you see the way we introduced uh, our uh, directed type theory, we were pretending that uh, we have a syntactic category to begin with. And therefore we forgot that it was a syntactic category. So it's just a category, a type with some extra structure or, or property. The extra structure is essentially a, a, a class of isofibrations and an interval. And everything else were just properties of this extra data expressed using the language of category theory. So I hope I convinced you that so far, we really developed the language of category theory. And therefore, and it applies to types. It means that you see a type is a category and therefore we can express category theoretical properties of types. And therefore we can, in some sense, define a type now to be uh, a type with a class of maps called isofibrations, an element called the interval, and repeat all the axioms, except that we can work up to equivalence. So we won't do the difference between equivalences, isomorphisms, and stuff like that. That means that we could also declare um, all maps to be isofibrations in a type, and then repeat the axioms otherwise. And then because we work in a type internally, there is again, no difference between orthotopy equivalences, isomorphisms and so forth. And, um, and the point is that what directed univalence tells you is that for instance, the, interpret the interpretation of the such axioms would say that the universe has these axioms and directed univalence would be a way to say that these axioms defined completely internally, they fit perfectly with the axioms we started from. So far, so good. But what I mean is that we could start from arbitrary type and instead of taking the universe, we could take any other type. And that would mean we would be also allowed to take this one. And that would be more interesting because now all the proofs we do, they, will be, they won't be only valid for, the, our, for our syntactic category, but they, but they will be valid for all this kind of object. And, uh, and that means that somehow all the formal proofs we can do in this axiomatic context, they will be dependent on such C, and in particular dependent on A in this sense, but in a way which is not the same as for group points. That would be, and what I mean is that what it means to develop the theory further would be to do at least this list, but it's not exhaustive at all. Yeah, so I would propose to do the series of presentable categories. After you do the theory of Pontoise can extension and so forth, theory of Topoi, Hutterads, they find, they find a bunch of algebraic geometry. For sure, K theory, that's something you can do very, very early on in the theory, Muktivik sheaves, whatnot, and so forth. Because there are a lot of constructions which are um, 
formulated nowadays in the setting of infinity category theory, which are so formal that they make sense in such context. Um, um, can, I, can I ask something? Sure. Could you comment on how to formulate the axioms inside C, in particular, the ones that refer to the tribe? So for example, yeah. this universal universality of sums, it says like there's an isomorphism of tribes. Okay, I can do How that. do you formulate this within the language of tribes? So, uh, as I said, you can say what it means to, to have adjoints. So if you have C, um, first you, you, you can say that it has sums. Sums you can say because, uh, for instance, uh, you, you can, um, um, as I said, you, you have to define what, what it means to have a, this makes sense as a finite sum, but it is a type. So if, if it is indexed by, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe how should I say that? So if you indexed, for any finite set i, you can say i finite set, that maybe you could produce by some induction process or whatever, you want to be constructive, of course, and uh, then you produce this sum, yeah? And then you can see your set as a type, you know what I'm saying, yeah? And uh, now I can exponent shape because I'm internal O, and then we say what it means to have an adjoint and so forth. And uh, or I could, I mean, maybe I'm too internal already. I don't know. Um, yeah. The, the point is to internalize very, very much actually, but okay, maybe we don't have to do that. So uh, you, you have this, this is what you call I, if some and then you, you can exponentiate, you take really the fun from I to C, and therefore you have a, a, a diagonal map, and you can ask that this has a left adjoint or right adjoint, and this is a way for all I. And uh, has a uh, say a left adjoint. That would be a, say, a way to say that uh, you have finite sums. And then, uh, in particular, if you have two types and two elements, you can force a sum, and therefore you can slice over it. Uh, and uh, you can form the product. And then uh, you can check that because you have two inclusions like that. And in the trap, you will also say that you have finite limits. Uh, in particular, uh, you don't say finite limits. You could say you have pullbacks and, and finite products, let's say. Uh, then you, using pullbacks, you will produce a functor this way. And so universality of, uh, of sums is this equivalence. I mean, you can do it for finitely many instead. I did it for just binary sums, but that would be universality of binary sums. I would like to suggest that we let Denis Charles go back to his slides and finish his presentation, and then we can have a discussion. Okay. Sorry, can I, um, <laughs> just a very quick question on this particular <laughs> slide. So okay. should I understand the Blackboard Bold C also as a, Delta knot shaped element of cat. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, you, you can. But, uh, as I said, you can you can interpret it in many ways. I mean, uh, we can come back to at the end. But uh, as I said, C can be it will be classified by a, a C. You know, C because there will be a C like this, so that um, you have a pullback square like that. And directed univalence is a way to say you can go back and forth between this small c and the and this c. And what I mean is that in our syntactic category, you can look at the slice, uh, or maybe uh, rather the full circuitry of the slice, which consists of isofibrations going to c. And here it would be also a type in the ordinary sense. And you can translate uh, properties, uh, uh, and of course you can also look at. Uh, uh, you can look at uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, right vibrations of a C and so forth like that, and that correspond to right vibrations from the internal external point of view. And therefore, you can translate, and here it would be a tribe in the ordinary sense, 
And so you can, and here you have a unit on bidding because this would be equivalent to this. And you can translate uh, uh, whatever you say in, in, in C using the unit on bidding into a full uh, a subtype here. So you can also rectify many properties in terms of ordinary type theory. But maybe, uh, so if you allow me, I will go further in, uh, uh, in uh, what I wanted to do. Also, I really at a stage when I really don't mind to discuss anything, don't worry. But, <laughs> um, so, uh, so where was I? Yeah, here. Then, uh, yeah, so maybe I wanted to state this as a theorem and maybe discuss a little bit uh, why it is a theorem. So I claim that the theory of quasi categories, the way as we know them, is indeed the semantic interpretation of all the axioms we have so far, including the strictest uh, possible. So, in some sense, the first part of the axioms is really to understand the theory of uh, join operators and how to, to interpret uh, invertibility of edges in, uh, in types and so forth. And, uh, and the fact that uh, uh, being a groupoid uh, is really the same as being a type in which all maps are invertible uh, and all these kind of things. And if you look at it, I think that what, I mean, Andre, you, you tell me if I'm wrong, but in some sense, in, I think that what Andre Joel has been working on uh, when he discovered, between the time uh, when he discovered the theory of quasi categories uh, after Roman and Vogt, and the time when he made uh, public the fact that he had uh, a theory there, was exactly essentially to prove uh, the first part of our action, I think. And then uh, the second part of the axioms are really mostly about the universe. And this, uh, if you, of course, uh, if you think of the equivalence, it is already in the, probably in the work of Andre and also in, uh, definitely in the work of Jacob Lurie in uh, higher cost theory, the fact that you can classify vibrations uh, and have a threatening and threatening is definitely the, the, the basic tool uh, that is developed in higher topos theory to begin with. But uh, the fact that uh, you can describe, uh, have a threatening and threatening using a strict uh, universe and so forth, uh, I think was developed so in my book on higher categories for left vibrations and then in, in, in my joint work with uh, Kim uh, and Guillaume uh, for cross-tangent vibrations. But this, uh, and if you put all that together, that is really a proof of the theorem. Uh, that would be a comment of that. Some the comment I would like to say is that uh, there is a difference between the point of view on higher categories that you can have if you read the higher topos theory or if you read uh, Luris uh, Kirodon. And if you look at what uh, Luris is doing in Kirodon, he's much, much closer to the point of view we have, we have now. Uh, I guess completely independently. I don't mean any, but I really mean that uh, he really does and work out all the constructions and proofs which are very, very compatible with uh, giving uh, another proof of the theorem is what I mean. He's doing that whether he likes it or not. Is what I mean. Another comment uh, is that, uh, uh, the, uh, so the theorem is about quasi-categories, but uh, if you like complete single spaces, uh, there is a thesis of Narasek who also constructed the universe of uh, left vibrations or co-cartesian vibrations in the context of uh, uh, complete single spaces. And then uh, uh, it's not very difficult to, to deduce from the case of quasi-categories together with uh, Narasek's construction that uh, the axioms, uh, all the axioms we discussed today uh, are actually hold true literally uh, for complete sigal spaces, and therefore that they also form a semantic interpretation. So that would be a comment on that. Uh, yeah, yes. I have a question. Sure. Uh, at a certain point, you observe that uh, in um, you know, directed uh, multiple theory, every type uh, can be sort of analyzed internally as a complete uh, single space satisfying, yeah, as a complete single space. Yes. Uh, so complete single space with respect to, I would say the um, uh, groupoids in some sense. Uh, yes. And that the groupoids uh, form something like uh, an elementary inf infinity topos, am I yes. right? Yes. 
Yes. Okay, so, but uh, of course, the notions of elementary affinity topos is not, uh, maybe not very clear at the moment. Uh, Nima Rasek uh, has been um, uh, trying to develop uh, something yes. along this direction. Yes. But uh, if uh, one could reconstruct uh, the, um, I would say, uh, the category of categories, uh, because this, this is somehow what you're describing, uh, an axiomatic uh, uh, yes. theory of uh, infinity one categories. Yes. But within this axiomatic uh, theory of infinity categories, you have also uh, virtually, I say virtually because it's not explicit in what in your talks, uh, and um, uh, an elementary theory of infinity topoi, right? And also, there is also the suggestion that one could reconstruct uh, the whole structure for, solely from this elementary theory of infinity topoi. Yeah, the, the, the only thing is to have delta. I'm sorry? The, 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 it seems that an issue is to have the simplex category. <clears throat> because uh, if it's That's the yeah. case, then uh, category theory that would show, but I don't know, but, but that would show that category theory is really somehow a, a construction, something that is derived from infinity topos theory or infinite. You see what I mean? That uh, Yeah, yeah. But uh, it's not clear to me uh, that it is the case yet. I, I believe it could. I mean, I, I don't mind, uh, but... Uh, because really, when I say here we can really do it, but it is really from an internal point of view. So it doesn't say that externally it is true. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so it's not completely clear. Yeah. So you see, in sense, there is no, um, you see, for, for the internal point of view, it is extremely uh, complete. Like, uh, uh, for, 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 from the external point of view, you, it will have all finite homotopy coordinates for sure. But for, from the internal point of view, uh, for, but for non-finite uh, collimeter, I don't think so, for instance. It will be really uh, really. It's So the inf everything that looks like infinite, it's not external. Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> uh, okay, so let me formulate uh, something um, um, that we have been discussing uh, this uh, problem um, a couple of weeks ago with Steve uh, and others, um, um, there is this classical theorem of uh, homotopy theory saying that uh, <clears throat> the loop space functor from the category of pointed connected spaces to groups is an equivalence uh, yes. of categories, yes. right? Yes. Uh, now, the, I'm sorry. That would be a consequence. I mean, in this setting, that would be cool. Sorry to interrupt, but uh, yeah. Yes, I, I agree with you. So that's a consequence uh, in your setting, uh, which yeah. is categorical and etc. Yes. Uh, but um, if we suppose that uh, everything can be constructed uh, from some theory of uh, elementary affinity topoi. Uh, that would seems to say that uh, that should be also a theorem of the theory of elementary infinity topoi, and uh, and then there is a problem because uh, I don't know uh, how to uh, introduce uh, um, uh, simplicial uh, types, for example. Um, I don't know. I, there is a uh, yeah. I don't know, because see, at least the way we did it uh, here, we introduced delta by just introducing the join. Yeah, I, I yeah. So we could just do that, no? Yeah, yeah, you, you, it a, you. It is an internet uh, a topos with an interval with yeah. enough stresses that the join is well behaved. Yeah, but I'm really puzzled because you get uh, uh, this uh, theorem of equivalence between pointed connected space and groups yeah. somehow. But but as a simple consequence, well, uh, rather natural but consequence, 
of uh, your axioms, etc. Uh, but uh, uh, it's it's kind of funny because it's 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 a theorem that should belongs to the theory of elementary infinity to a poly, mm -hmm. uh, and there I don't know how to do it. So if you look at the axioms, also what is funny is that uh, with a with a join we can produce the synthesis. That so far that's good. But then if you want to globalize that as a category object, we used this uh, uh, the type formula, which consists to take the full subcategory generated by a class of objects. And this yes. used really the language of category theory. I mean, you see, it's not something I formulated in the language of Topoi. So at least in the way we present things, we doesn't solve the problem of producing the, cat the category delta in an elementary topos, actually, despite what I said with joins. The, the, the way we globalize the construction from the, coll the mere collection of synthesis to the actual category of simplex, use category theory so far as a globalization tool. Yeah. To have a collection of simplicity as opposed to. I don't know approach. if uh, I'm tempted to conclude, but at least yes. uh, as a tentative conclusion, yes. that maybe uh, the theory of infinity one categories is essential for an elementary development of the theory of infinity topoi. I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <Amen. laughs> well, I'm, it's not a definitive conclusion because uh, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> maybe it may turn out to be different, but uh, it could be that you cannot do, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Chow, yes. So we uh, we are almost uh, over with the time. There's only half an hour left for the okay. discussion. Okay. So maybe uh, well, the discussion has a, a bit started already. Yes. But could you do you mind? You have a part on syntax. I think that would be of interest. Exactly. Yeah. You. Maybe at least I can show you that, and, uh, and then if you want to hear more, I can tell you. Okay, so then, great. Uh, Thank you. So I go quickly to whatever. Yeah, so I think this was just about Quillen's RMB because that's fun. You can have a look. So the slides will be on, on, online anyway. And we see Quillen's RMB just for a few words. I mean, it, it, it comes from descent theory, which is essentially classical univalence interpreted very, very internally in the type of operates. And then, uh, and then this uh, pi infinity. And then you prove, uh, and of, of course, you have also to prove. Uh, a bunch of things which are consequence of a Vionet dilemma, and then you have Quillen's RMB. But okay, so I, I go quick, and I, I won't explain that here. So about the syntax. So I think if there is something to, to, to keep, so I won't provide the full syntax yet, and actually I would be very happy to discuss that because there are things we don't know yet, so be, I just would have, I have questions myself actually. So, <laughs> but just to, to, to be clear about what happens is that ordinary, uh, Type theory should speak this kind of language. You have to declare types. And what I mean is that we should be able to, we should have two levels of declaration. So this is why you have this strange thing. So I did the double, whatever, but it doesn't matter which symbol. I would, I would be happy to change that if you tell me it's not good or whatever. But you need another symbol. You, you need two deduction symbols. So a one-dimensional one and a two-dimensional one. And uh, a basic rule is that if you, if you declare, and so the point is that if you, if you have, the more declaration you have, the more functorial it should be. And the point is that if you declare a type A in context gamma, it's not really functorial, yeah? Whereas if you declare this with this sign, it should mean that it is functorial in gamma. That's what it should mean. Uh, so in particular, just, yes? I mean, how do you, do you define a context? I mean, a context in principle, in in a tribe is just an object, it's just another object. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. You, what, you, so what is your context here? It is exactly uh, what you said. It's just a just type. The, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Here it, it, this, this thing is a way to introduce an isofabrication uh, of a gamma. Okay. And of course, we want to do that. I mean, when I say this, I don't mean that this is forbidden. I say this is there. I say there is something else you want to say. There is another way to introduce this. And I just said that if you introduce something in this fancy way, of course, 
it is in particular an other vibration. So you have this diffusion world. But then you have to say what it means to be functorial. And what it means is that, of course, so in particular, because you have this, so it is an ordinary isofibration to begin with. But then the functoriality means that it is co Cartesian. That is, you want to say that the fibers are, depend on the elements of gamma functorially, where the functoriality depends on the arrows in gamma, whatever that means. Okay? Um, and then, of course, uh, what we have seen is that if you have an interval i with two elements zero and i, then you can define what is a deformation retract, and therefore you can define what is a left deformation retract, and therefore define what is a notion of co-cartesian fibration with respect to the interval. Before any interval, you can do that. And then, uh, and for this, you don't need a lot of properties for the interval. It's really just a guy with two elements, and you don't even care if the elements agree or not, are separated or not. Who cares? So in particular, an example of an interval is a terminal object. Yeah? And of course, if you take the terminal object, everything is a co-cartesian vibration. And that means uh, if, you, if uh, the functoriality means you are supposed to be co-cartesian, uh, you see what it means is that the, the fancy thing, in fact, depends on an interval. And the absolute case is, in fact, a particular case of the interval case. It's just that it depends on the interval, which is given by the terminal object. Yeah. So it means that but, any interval gives you a fancy functoriality of types. Uh, uh, yes? Then, Shao, uh, your axioms on the interval are supposing that two endpoints are, dis are disjoint, that there is a pullback. Th right? That is true. But what so, I think. So the terminal, the terminal cannot be an interval. I, I agree. But okay. here I'm changing the definition slightly. I just say that to define co Cartesian, we don't need these extra properties we ask. Okay. So, so maybe we could, instead of an interval, we could say interval with uh, quote marks. Yeah. And we, when we take away the quote marks if the axioms are true. Yeah. But right. what I say is that to define co Cartesian with respect to I, we don't care that it is an, actually an interval. Okay. Yeah. So if the, the interval, yeah. It, I mean, what, what you're using is what I call a strict interval, meaning that. Uh, the two points are distinct in the sense that yeah, exactly. like which is why you see uh, so we could propose that for each interval there's a diminution principle in some sense whatever that means okay and, and the and the, and the absolute case is the usual one okay yeah so what i mean is that the presence of an interval defines uh, a notion of vibration which are the co-cartesian vibration with respect to this interval and of course uh, because it's so formal if you have an interval with n point zero and one you can declare, you can exchange and declare one to be the initial object and so forth. And therefore you can dualize. And, uh, and you see in some sense, automatically you have also Cartesian vibration and so forth, it, but it's just the same thing with another interval. And it is a very formal thing. Um, what I mean is that uh, what we do with ordinary type theory is that we want to define functions. Maybe where did I want? Oh, I do this anyway. It's not exactly the slide, but not the way I expected them to be. But, uh, the idea is that uh, um, we could use also the notation that we use in two category theory. We, we use this uh, kind of arrows for natural transformation. Um, I say this because we have already the type, the, the arrow, the simple arrow is already the type of uh, the internal O. So it's already taken. So, but it will be good to know that we have a type of maps from an, an element A to an element B. Yeah, so it will be a notation for it. And, uh, and of course, so if the interval uh, now with the axons we want uh, is defined, so we would like to say that to, to have this uh, rule should be the same thing as having an interval map like this. But if you take the rule with the ordinary sense, it should correspond to take only the maximum group width. I think I missed a slide or maybe exchange a slide in my note. I'm sorry. Yeah, maybe the, I think I exchanged some slides. So uh, maybe I'll come back to it. So what I mean is that to, to define, um, all right, maybe it's okay. Not even that. What I mean is, uh, so to define a map from the interval, which would be really what a map in A is, it could be this kind of rule as opposed to this one. Because you see, if you have this rule, it should mean, in fact, it, it's a map from the group it. And therefore, this kind of rule would just say you have uh, two, a pair of elements. Now, this rule is really a map like this. Yeah. And you see, that's what it means that it depends functorially 
uh, on the elements. And therefore, since you have a map on zero to one, you get actually a map in A. Yeah. And, uh, and the same for natural transformation. And that would look like more what we are used to when you ex express natural transformations. That is, a, that is a, a, an element in the types of maps in context X. Yeah. And that's how you can try to implement that. Um, uh, yeah, and maybe I, I will stop there just, just to say that, uh, so I will end with a question about uh, syntax, because I think we are able to do syntax very, very nicely uh, in this setting. The only problem that I see so far, and that's maybe just because uh, we don't know enough about syntactic things. So the problem is not about existence of a syntactic category, but we want to have a very nice description of it, is what I mean. So uh, in, the, in the axioms, we did introduce, we, we, in some axioms, we introduced some type of structure and say that they produce vibrations. And this, to be honest, I don't know exactly how to implement in the sense that for me, bringing a vibration is supposed to, it's also what you do if, when you introduce context and so forth inductively. And so to force the construction to be a vibration, to be honest, I'm not sure I understand that. So I will be very happy to learn. And uh, I say this because if it, if it makes life easier, so we did force, uh, we wanted, for instance, that restriction to the boundary should be a vibration like this. But what I mean is that it could be easier to force that this is a vibration because this is in the language of Rupert. And then this, I think we understand much better how to do it. That would be a way to enforce this isomorphism. And this, I think, makes sense uh, in terms of. Uh, and then to enforce this homotopy pullback. And what I mean is that all, in many of the situations when we did introduce iso vibrations by brute force, we only need that, uh, in some sense, when we take the maximum Rupert, we get. Uh, um, uh, an actual iso vibration. And for instance, in this case, for instance, that it is a number to be pulled back. If you know it is an iso vibration, our axon will prove that it is a number to be pulled back. But uh, I mean, that's, if it makes life easier and produce a nicer uh, syntactic category, it would be a way to relax the axons a little bit in a way I would understand. But otherwise, well, I'll be happy to understand how to construct a syntactic category which enforce that this is an iso vibration, for instance. Because to be honest, I don't understand that myself. And I will end here. And thank you very much for your attention. Oh, my son. OK, thank you very much, Denisal. We can go back to the discussion now if people have more questions. I would have a question. Um, yes. So about formulating these axioms internally. For example, you have this axiom on the this hierarchy of universes. Yes. And it it was somehow formulated externally in the sense of you have subtribes and there's like. Uh, indexed by a set which lives externally. Like, how do you formulate this internally to your? That, that's theory? true. So, um, I don't know. Maybe I can add a slide at the end or whatever. Uh, it's true that uh, uh, from an internal point of view, uh, uh, it means you have a sequence of tribes, and each of these is fully faceful. I guess, something like that. And then uh, uh, you, you have to, to say that uh, in, in each, uh, um, uh, this, and then of course, each of these should come from a, with a Cartesian vibration. And these should be pullbacks or multiple pullbacks or whatever. And so forth. Uh, and, um, and then uh, you have to express some kind of univalence and so forth. What I mean. So, in particular, you, yeah. And of course, you want to say that uh, the, the, you want to interpret this as an element here. And so forth. So, you, you have to do that intuitively.
which is exactly you see from um, the, the the way we do it is that uh, from the we have a hierarchy of universes. Exactly the situation we have. Also, as I said, you can do the, the co-limits or the homotopy co-limit if you want. Will exist. So, but in fact, you could also say that everything fits. So maybe, okay, maybe actually this is, I'm thinking out loud, so maybe. Uh, what I mean is that you could actually define some C infinity, which is very big, and then have a hierarchy of full subcategories and so forth. Um, and then each of the finite step will be a universe. And but of course you won't have, I mean, this is too big somehow. So in, in here, you, you, don't, you, won't, you won't formulate that you have a, a kind of category. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Uh, are you supposing that this sequence is actually indexed by the internal natural numbers or the external no. natural numbers? No, no, I don't. I mean, you're not. It could be, I think the internal thing would be very sufficient. Um, as I said, what I mean is that you could have a, a tribe which is really the category of all categories, except possibly super large. And then you can say that if you have a certain, this you call the C infinity or whatever, and then you have a bunch of subcategories. And it should, this should be equipped with a co cartesian fibration, which is should be the, the universal one, but it's too big to be representable. <clears throat> and it should be a, a, some full subcategories so that when you pull back, uh, it should be uh, representable in the sense that uh, there is a, another universe uh, so that uh, it, it, it could uh, be representable and so forth. I mean, it, it's really. Uh, Another way to say it is that if you can repeat the axioms literally, this is also why maybe, let me, I don't know if it's clearer, but uh, it's also another way to form, reformulate everything. As I said, once you have C, which is your ambient category, whatever, uh, so you have the uh, right vibrations of a C. And it, it is a type, yeah? So it's really a full subcategory of this. But now C, it corresponds to uh, 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 an element of the universe for some size. And, uh, and therefore, and this, and, and this by directed univalence corresponds to something like that. And you have a unit on bidding. And so now you can look at all the right vibrations such that X has a terminal object. And this corresponds to the essential image of a representable from the so, which are representable. And now if C has finite limits in the abstract sense, for instance, would be equivalent to say that C uh, no, not uh, maybe, um, maybe this. Um, so maybe if you look at the, the collection of this as a, the representable vibrations, as a full subcategory of this slice, so C has finite limit is equivalent to say that this is a tribe in the classical sense. And now you can start again. You could formulate the axioms here. Except that uh, since you want to say that uh, some axioms, we say that uh, some construction will be defined by universal property and so forth. So in, it means that here it will be a tribe, but all the, uh, apart from being a tribe, everything else. So basically everything which is introduced in terms of dependent products, like internal homes, dependent products kind of like, and so forth, they will only be, uh, introduced up to equivalence, as opposed up to isomorphism. But from this point of view, it will be only up to isomorphism right away. 
But otherwise, uh, it means that whenever we say pullback or whatever, on the right hand side here, it will always be a motor P pullback. Everything will be well defined up to equivalence only and so forth. But the point of directed univalence or univalence in general, anyway, is that you can work up to equivalence anyway. It is designed for that. So, so it means you can weaken the axioms. And you could ask, also, why didn't we introduce the axioms to begin with in a very weak sense? And to be honest, that is for very silly reasons. It's just because I would like to have a type of maps. And otherwise, I don't know, in the syntax, we, we don't know, I mean, at least we were not able to be satisfied, but to have a syntactic category where the maps are not element of a type. I mean, but uh, otherwise, we could also try to relax many, many things to begin with, to have a more homogeneous thing. Yeah. <clears throat> I may have other questions, but uh, I don't want to take all the, all the time which is left. Uh, there's only 10 minutes left. Uh, maybe uh, other people want to comments or questions. Andre, I'm eager to hear what you have to say. Uh, I'll just make a quick comment though. Um, yes. I, I think this is a very useful and exciting development and it will be, um, it will be very good as a target for a working type theory. Um, it's maybe I'll suggest something. You tell me if you agree that what we have is a kind of axiomatization of the semantics for a system of type theory so that we know what exactly we want to formalize in the type theory and what depends on what, and it articulates and structures the intended interpretation of the type theory in a very useful way, maybe in the way that the axiomatic description of a Cartesian closed category was very good to have for formulating the lambda calculus. Mm -hmm. but, but I think that what we have is more on the side of the axiomatic description of the semantics, like the Cartesian closed category, than it is on the side of the lambda calculus itself. So maybe I would suggest the term abstract type theory to describe this system as an intermediate in between an actual formal implemented system of type theory and the big unclear world of possible semantics and all the different structures that one could try to capture in a type theory. In between is this abstract type theory, which specifies a particular structure that we want to capture in our type theory, which is a very, very useful methodological step. It's maybe like, Andre's axiomatic description of the notion of a tribe, which helped us to clarify and make precise what it is that we capture in a homotopy type theory. I don't, I don't know if that's a useful description, but I'm trying to maybe reconcile. Some people would prefer to call a type theory only something which can immediately be implemented in a computer. So that's so different than the, an abstract description of a structure that we would want to describe in such a type theory. So maybe abstract type theory is a way of formulating it. Does that seem congenial to you, Danny Sean? It does so far, but uh, I still hope to reach the point when we have an actual type theory. That's I, I agree, point. I hope so. Too. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt, yeah. Sorry, what did you say? I say that I agree with what you say, but uh, 
I still have the hope to, to be able to, to, to produce an actual syntax for that. And that would mean to implement that in a computer. Yeah. Uh, that really is the, the goal of that is to do it. What I mean is that I really would like that we can implement all these theorems of uh, higher category theory in a computer without uh, waiting for the uh, uh, proof that or, or construction of uh, category theory within uh, classical thought. Yeah. Because I think that all these theorems we have in higher category theory, they are already formalized or close to be formalized enough. And I would be very happy if we could contribute to that. And so I agree that uh, until we, we provide actual complete description of the syntactic category, we cannot pretend that but it is really exactly the whole of what we do. Yeah. We want to do that. Hmm. So I agree with you, but uh, hopefully it will be temporary. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think that's a good that's a good position. It, what, one thing that I think you've shown very clearly is how much can be done in such a system when we have it. Yes. It will be it, it will be possible to do a lot more than we imagined maybe in homotopy type theory, exactly. because you capture, yeah. you capture all of cat categories, not just the groupoids in a way. Exactly. And yeah. so you can internalize a lot of the reasoning and a lot of the constructions. It will be very powerful, I think, to have such a system. And also what you've shown is that we're, we're very close to it. There are a few ingredients, right? Yes. And you've shown how to axiomatize it in terms of the interval and a few concepts and how those basic concepts fit together. And I think it's very plausible at this point that one can turn this into a formal type theory. It's very yeah. close. So it's very close. And I find that very exciting. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe uh, then I can uh, ask uh, a naive question. Uh, sure. When you introduce a context gamma mm -hmm. uh, in classical type theory, it's kind of very essential that uh, everything that you do can be done in context. Yes. But of course, uh, you have two kinds of contexts. And uh, for one of them, um, <clears throat> the, your axioms cannot be, are not true. Because just slicing uh, using uh, isovibrations over an object A produce uh, a tribe which is which does not satisfy yes. all the axioms, right? Because it's not, for example, Cartesian flows. Because yes. your the, the cat is not locally Cartesian flows, so yes. you cannot uh, slice over any object. No. So uh, that is really going. Good. Yes, of course, of, exactly. Yeah. So um, uh, that's, is it the answer to my questions that you should only slice or maybe do context over group weights? It's not that you should, as I said, I think you have to develop a syntax when you have two, de two deduction rules. Because you see, how should I, um, see, you want, for instance, you want to say that, you want to say that. I mean, I want to say that, <laughs> to define a function, yeah? And this is not true. So that's why well, I introduced the other one, because then it becomes true. Well, the, the first one is sort of true because it is true in any tribe. Yeah, but uh, here it will be interpreted this way to produce something like that. No, I, I agree, but yeah, the first one is I would because you, you, if the ordinary things, they only yeah. do it. And that's why yeah. there's something which says it is functorial in some way. And it is an extra thing. And uh, but, but, your way out. And that is your interval. You see, it depends on, on your interval, this is what I meant. The, the introduction of the interval is the introduction of another deduction rule. Is that, it's not exactly the same thing, but that's what it provides. I, I completely agree with you. That there is a yeah, difference between the two. I completely agree there is a difference between the two. I just, I'm a little bit, yeah, okay, so this yeah, is it, something it means, to explore. Yeah, yeah it, it means that you have deduction rules which depends on intervals and 
you have to cope with it. Right. Yeah. So this but, is a very non-trivial ingredient that we introduce. You see, everything depends yeah. on it. Yeah. And that changes the deduction rule. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. And maybe you should, one can also still add at this point that uh, you, you can, of course, go back and forth between these two. So you can always go from the top to the bottom. And then, as we saw last week, you can go back as long as you have universal constructions. So you have some sort of yeah. inbuilt functorality of, un un of universal constructions. And so as long as you're producing terminal objects or some other universal objects, they are automatically functorial. And that allows you to move from the upper context to the lower context. Yeah. Maybe I'll yeah, what, uh, make uh, one suggestion. Uh, is my, okay. Can I make a suggestion? Um, yeah, sure. It's, it's, so you had the reflection uh, of the universe of categories into the universe of groupoids. Mm -hmm. uh, it was one of the results at the end. Maybe that suggests a, a modality our modal operator in the type theory, because mm -hmm. when you have such a reflection on the universe, then you get a weak factorization system and so forth. That's a some yeah, work that was done by it's, it's not... Eg, Eg, Egbert Reich and um, I think Mike Schulman and maybe Ulrich was involved. Anyway, somebody can, yeah. can maybe cite the paper in the chat mm -hmm. that um, I think will give the weak factorization system and from it a modality, it, yeah, and it, it suggests that maybe the same kind of technology, I'm not saying exactly the same thing, mm -hmm. but the same kind of idea might be useful for formulating this setup with the two different uh, symbols for implication. Perhaps some of the ideas from modal type theory would be useful because mm -hmm. the modal type theory also has constraints on building of contexts and using the contexts and, okay. and and it formalizes the way that the different kinds of contexts and judgments are related to each other. So mm -hmm. perhaps some of those ideas could be used. I'm not saying it's an mm -hmm. exactly an instance of modal type theory, but it's formally related. Yeah, yes, yes. I'll have a look. I'm afraid it won't be exactly that. But no, it uh, it's true, there are a lot of in common. But you see, we, if you look at what the, I think introduced somewhere some uh, factorization system with a left and a line maps and stuff like that. Yep. And uh, I think it was around here or something. And the, the and it, but uh, you see, it's really factorization system in terms of left and and left vibration, for instance. Yeah. But you have also another factorization system, which is uh, fully faced with left adjoint and pro-Cartesian vibrations, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, maybe it is also a factorization system. So maybe we just have a lot of factorization systems. Maybe it's just that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, maybe it, then, it is actually more relevant than what I think. <laughs> yeah. And if, when, whenever you have such a factorization system, if it's a stable one, Yes. Then it's given by an operation on the universe. Yeah, it, it, they uh, are like this. This factorization system are closed in the proof back. Yeah, exactly. And so you have operators on the universe which are inducing um, uh, the factorizations. Actually, actually, these are not exactly. Uh, this is no. that's not the point. Yeah. Also, that, um, for instance, yeah. the, if you have a co-cartesian vibration uh, to A, and then I didn't introduce this, this is a kind of modality, as you say. And this is the, uh, compatible with pullbacks. But you see that yeah. the point is that we have the universe of Cartesian vibrations, but there is no universe for iso vibrations. Uh -huh. and, and so so what you do with iso vibration is not nice in this sense. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. This in respect to what we are used to in type theory. So okay. the part of it, so whatever, all the vibrations which are classified by a universe, like Cartesian vibrations, they will be very neatly uh, understood. But there, is, yeah. there are also other things which are not representable somehow, and uh, okay. have to cope with it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good. 
I just want to make a quick comment on what uh, Steve has said. So um, I think Paige Randall North and Benno Vandenberg, they have some work going in this direction that you have enhancing the, the syntax with some modal operators. So mm -hmm. to, in, um, to be able to express the core operation and the opposite operation, it, it seems very useful to sort of do this kind of directed type theory. And I, I, I want to make another comment on syntax. Yes. And it's basically um, somehow uh, one of the problems that we have is that, I mean, we start with the tribe, right? So basically what we have syntactically is already kind of, uh, you know, dependent type theory, sigma types and function types. So we do have this rule that we have a dependent term. This gives a function, but it's not really what we want. We want some encode some functionality somehow. And what Denis Schatz suggested is that to have another deduction rule. And we can try and work this out, but there's still the problem that, I mean, we can do whatever we want in syntax, but we have to provide at some point an interpretation from the syntax to build a syntactic category with, which does have the features that we have in our abstract uh, dependent type theory. And this is something, for example, I don't know how to do this. So if I introduce an, a formal new in, uh, deduction rule, I don't know what to do with this to build a syntactic category, for example. So, uh, I mean, I just want to say that uh, anything syntactically is very welcome if someone has suggestions or ideas, because yeah. I don't know what I'm doing. I mean, just comment on what you say, which is uh, very, very relevant, of course. But uh, the, the resolution rule, so you see, it's a way to introduce uh, concatenation vibrations. And for concatenation vibrations, so you see, for ordinary vibrations, we have nothing. We, we don't have a, we don't have a, a universe, not a representable one, at least, for isovibrations. But for concatenation vibrations, we have a universe. And uh, what I mean is that this extra deduction rule is in fact just the introduction of this extra universe. It's just an iso vibration that we, uh, it has a property with respect to the interval, but it is given somehow. It is, because being a vibration from a constructive point of view, a concatenation vibration is literally being a pullback of that, as opposed to be an abstract iso vibration or whatever. Mm. If it was just to say that, uh, maybe we can play with it. But uh, it's true that I don't know how to solve that right away either. <clears throat> um, maybe a last question. Uh, are you going to put some of your notes or on the archive or something like this soon? I don't think we are ready for archive, but uh, all the, you know, the slides we, we prepared, we, we share on the site of the seminar. Uh, it was actually a, an opportunity to prepare, preparing the talks to actually write down a lot of things because to be honest, we never wrote anything down before. We did discuss for a while. <laughs> so it is also a very good thing that we need to be invited to give the talk because I think now we are, we are on track to, but uh, it depends how, what, what do you, you call soon, yeah. And not tomorrow, but soon enough, hopefully I would like that, definitely. <laughs> Um, I would but also we, have a question. Sure. We do make the slides available on the website from the seminar. So yes, here, but Hugh has already put it in the chat. Yes, okay. but the chat will disappear. Yeah, but the website for so the, the slides will, will not. not disappear. Yeah. 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 yeah the same. <clears throat> uh, can I ask? Can I ask another question? Sure. Independent. <laughs> yeah. So, following up on, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, following up on what uh, Steve, uh, mm -hmm. what Steve said about uh, model operators, and I, uh, so, I mean, so there is another. There is a slightly. I mean, there is a related approach which is uh, developed in. Emily Real and Mike Schulman's paper on where they use a model in simplicial spaces, but they yes. work. not every object is a yes. is an infinity category, but the infinity categories are kind of characterized yes. by lifting properties. 
Yes. And so this would be a cohesive topos, and there you have. Yes. The, I mean, there the, 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 these theory of modalities is fairly well understood, and yeah. I guess probably the modalities restrict to the um, to the infinity categories. But I was just wondering whether you have some comments yeah. on. It would this work. approach. This direction would work. I mean, it would be a way to formalize it. I'm not sure it would be the syntactic category, whatever we are talking about, <laughs> but it would definitely provide us another semantic interpretation that would be already good because we would be closer to implementing in a computer, for instance. <laughs> because definitely, if you restrict to complete single spaces in the in the simplicial types, a la real and true man, uh, you can express everything. In particular, you can also just ask that all the axioms we want are true in this context. And that would be a way to formalize it, I think, in the computer. That wouldn't be the universal way, but it would be something already. And that would be already quite happy with that. And why would this not be universal? Uh, I, I, I don't know. You I mean it's not... that I don't know it would be, because I think this, I, 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 uh, that would be a way to enforce that external. You see, what is true is that uh, internally, the universe will be described as complete single spaces uh, internally. And here, what we are doing is that we are, mm -hmm. we are forcing this to be true in the syntactic category somehow, which is fine. I mean, it would be true. I mean, in all the examples I have in mind in ordinary mathematics, is it the case anyway? So I, I just don't mind that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not clear to me that the, the, the universal synthetic category would do that. I don't, I don't know. Okay, okay. I, I don't think Thank it's you. not true. <laughs> I don't know if it's true. But, it's but your, true me. your type theory your type theory does not uh, try to talk about simplicial objects which are not uh, complete single spaces. It does it, but internally, it? as you say, see, it, and it, it's not. It, it was not the goal, but uh, it, it, as a fact, it does. That's what I said as a theorem. Mm. Uh, okay. It, 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 it does. Uh, yeah, yeah it, it does because you can talk about uh, sampleable object. Yeah, exactly. Sampleable groupoids. Yes. And some sampleable groupoids are single space, and some other are complete single space, which are etc. So in some sense, it could be that it turned out that your the whole structure that you're describing is equivalent to uh, Schulman and Riel. It could be. Uh, yes. It could be that it's just Schulman Riel and with, they, uh, they, that with they can be system. they can be reinterpreted in each other. Yeah, that would be very wonderful. I would like that. So. And for sure, okay. I'm, I'm pretty, I'm completely convinced that you can do semantic interpretation in a Schulman real kind of formalism. And conversely, maybe. Conversely, uh, it's less obvious, but it, it could, could be. It could be, but uh, I don't know. But uh, there is no reason uh, not to. But uh, it, it, it's less obvious to me how to do that. Because this is a simplicial object. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how free it can be. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. No. I believe that the, yeah, the syntactic category does not embed faith fully into the or fully faithfully into the asymplicial spaces. <clears throat> yeah, because you see, even if we can do it internally in the universe, externally, it would be very homotopy theoretic somehow. Uh, so you, you, you will be able to have a theory of Scaletta and so forth, but it will, be, uh, it will involve homotopy push-outs as opposed to actual push-outs and stuff like that. It won't be very strict. One, maybe a related question is whether uh, in the, maybe this is a question to Emily. Yes, Emily. Uh, <clears throat> among the um, sempicial object, I suppose that you can extract 
in your in your setting among the types the the types in principle they are some kind of simple groupoids uh, i suppose that you can extract the constant groupoids and that would be like s and then could you reconstruct uh, the types in terms of simple object in s where s is defined to be the constant simpicial, the the internal category of constant simpicial groupoids. My question is a bit, uh, uh, my formulation is a bit vague and maybe um, I don't know how to formulate it in a precise way. Right, I mean, in our setup, we don't have a, you know, we have not included included axioms that provide us an object internally that represents the full simplex category. Um, so, uh, you know, so there's, there's a sense that semantically we're talking about simplicial objects, but internally we're not talking about simplicial objects. Yeah, I agree, uh, except that uh, you do have a universe uh in your types right there is a universe th that you do have right and yeah so we just have a, an ordinary universe that classifies types yes. in the ordinary way um you know more recent work by others yeah, uh, yeah. but well, you yeah. Th there is no definition or there is no way to define what is a constant simple object meaning that uh uh the exponential with the interval is just the diagonal from the object to the exponential yeah so we do it's right. an equivalence so, yeah so that we do have we, we call them discrete types and it's a it's exactly oh, that, as that's what what i would okay they, these are my constant semi-set object uh right so now i understand you sure yes yeah, okay yeah. And, and then you have this would be like s I mean, in some way, and may, so maybe there is a way to actually uh, write. I don't know. Okay, this is something to investigate. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe we well, should maybe say thank a, you. Bye. Oh, sorry, Steve. No, go ahead, Matthew, please. Okay, now I was about to, to thank again Donishal and Kim and Tashi for their lectures. And we really appreciated the, the work here you've put into giving those lectures. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for Yeah, that, that's, that's very nice. Yeah. I'm gonna stop the recording. It's uh, before uh, Bill Avir would would say it's a giant step ahead. <laughs>